Hey, thanks for checking out the teaching from Calvary Chapel Chattanooga. To learn more about us, you could go to our website, calvarychat.com, or you could take us wherever you go by downloading our free app. There, you'll find teachings, how to get involved in what God is doing here, and you can even support the work that he is doing through secure online giving. In the meantime, grab your Bible and enjoy the teaching. Hey, Calvary Chapel, Pastor Frank here. Um, last time I've last been with you, I was a part of our Freedom Tour through Boston. It was just such a rich experience. Again, I had the privilege of holding my first granddaughter, Sayla Grace. She's just an absolute treasure, an absolute bundle of joy. And I was able to lead our leadership team through our annual prayer and planning retreat. Um, you may have heard since then, I fully ruptured my Achilles tendon and I have undergone surgery to begin to correct that. Uh, I hope to be on the mend here soon. I'll get out of a cast before too long and we'll begin the slow, real rehabilitative process. But I was hoping to be with you last week and this week, and this week in particular, this weekend before this seismic election to share um, an election election message. I've been reading some, uh, some uh, political sermons of the early American founders, and you can imagine there were no small amount of sermons preached. We're told today to the pulpit should keep real quiet, but uh, that hasn't been historically accurate. And so I hope to pick up on about a 300 year tradition and, and uh, preach a political sermon before this, before this moment. But nevertheless, um, things are different and I'll have to suffice for just a few uh, minutes. I do feel that uh, to, for a church like ours, um, an election message may have in many ways been sort of redundant for it is true that you routinely hear over the last years have heard more um, from a bi biblical perspective on what we face culturally and morally and politically than many churches would, I think, dare to take on ever. So um, I, I think you're, um, I think you can handle just a few moments. I've just got one big idea that, that I feel led to uh, share before we, before we pray. Um, and I got a few verses that uh, come to mind to sort of frame um, this one overarching principle. First, James says this, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. That's James 4, 17. We call that the sin, sin of omission. Then Paul writes, for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And then from Jesus' own lips to a group of people that should have known better, he said, to religious leaders, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Church, here's the cr crux of this uh, simple exhortation. We cannot afford to sit this one out. As I'm told by George Barna, this year in this election, 32 million Christians are choosing to opt out. They're gonna go to the sidelines. And I can completely sympathize with those of you who feel this way. I've wrestled through this myself. My candidate is not in the race either. My values aren't completely represented here either, not perfectly. But listen, this temptation to opt out, or if you do participate to, you know, put in a write-in candidate, which essentially amounts to the same as opting out, simply means that we, like Israel of old, just don't understand the critical nature of this moment. And... Um, I'm convinced that the Christian in the West is going to be judged for how he or she voted. I really do. And I'm convinced that uh, in this regard, many evangelical Christians in the West are going to have some explaining to do. Um, and I just, quick side note, to those of you who now by grace have recognized your error in the past, you've got to repent. You must repent of the part that you played and what it is that has come upon us. I feel many Christians have blood on their hands and will answer for it one day. And so repentance is available. Please repent and demonstrate that by a work that's appropriate. Now, all that being said, here's where we are. You've heard many say it's, it's more than a cultural war, it, but it is a war nonetheless. It is a spiritual battle. And when war is the reality of the environment, um, the issue isn't policy in the end. Policy only comes after one side has acquired the power and then there's quote unquote peace so that policies can be 
enacted. It, it is a full on war. So if you're going to set it out because there's no pro-life party on the ballot, and to be fair, there isn't. Listen, we're, we're never going to defend life and defeat the evil of abortion if in this country if there's no longer a country to defeat it in. And so with that being said, the worldviews presented by both presidential candidates could not be further from, well, further apart, and they could not be any clear. I don't have to tell you, church, which way to vote. I'm confident that you will and that you'll vote the right way. If you're unclear at this point as to which of these two candidates to choose, then perhaps I have absolutely failed you as your pastor. And if that's the case, then I, this is a full public apology. This is altogether clear. This isn't in any way foggy. This isn't in any way vague. It is altogether clear what it is that we must do. Remember, to know what it is that you must do, to know the good that you must do and not to do it, it is sin. And I don't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm trying to lead you from that regret. We're all gonna stand before a judgment seat and we're all gonna give an account for what it is that we did in these mortal bodies, whether good or bad. And so we face a critical moment. This is a critical juncture. Um, would you join me now as we appeal to heaven one last time together corporately, well, before this seismic election. Father God Almighty, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would be merciful to us as a nation, as a people. We don't deserve mercy, but we are begging you to be as you are so merciful. We pray that your mercy is going to be brand new, as your word declares, on November 6th, as it was today. We pray that you would give us the judgment and the discernment to know the part that we need to play. Give us the grace to engage in this vital time and may we heed the high call with an answerable courage fit for the moment and all God's people say amen and amen. God bless you, church. Love you so much. I hope to be back with you ASAP. Hey, Calvary Chapel, great to see you guys. Cool. Listen, I know y'all were stoked about an election sermon, and they figured out, how can we disappoint them the best? We'll just put Tyler up there, and we'll see what happens. Uh, no, it's great to see you guys. If you would, flip open to 1 Samuel chapter 12. That's where we're going to be spending our time. We are, um, we are going to attempt to knock down the whole chapter and do communion, so uh, let's all pray for time to stand still. If... Um, History continues to prove itself consistent. Um, uh, let, me, let me do this. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're, we're literally just going to jump straight in. You all right with that? All right. You guys are a little bit sleepy, so we're going we're gonna to pray, and we're going to see who, you know, maybe the Holy Spirit will wake some of you guys up. All right. Lord, we come before you. We, uh, we, um, we thank you so much for an unbelievable opportunity to step before your word. It is inspired, it is God-breathed, and that is why we cling to it. That is why we study it verse by verse. That is why we commit our life to not, not finding the ideas that we would like from it, but extracting the truth that is so evidently communicated by it. And so would, would, this, uh, would this evening be no different? Would we, would we lean in and study together words that, that have transcended from generation to generation and truths that literally transform lives and make them completely different. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak. It is, it is just an absolute truth. If you do not speak, nothing happens. We are dependent on you for understanding. We are dependent on you to hear clearly. So would you come in Christ's name? And everyone said, Amen. all right, there they go. All right, so here's where we're at. Saul has been appointed the king. Saul has been appointed king. Um, we, uh, we saw, uh, if you didn't catch Pastor Billy's teaching last week on, on 1 Samuel chapter 11, it was fantastic. Uh, if you remember, they were considering the Israelites, just for context, uh, they were considering offering up their right eyeballs to Nahash, and Saul steps in and leads them in this really incredible victory. And at this moment, while they're celebrating their victory and praising um, their new beloved king, Samuel has something to say this week. 
And uh, it's going to be a little bit interesting because in light of their delusional joy as they have not yet considered the weight of their decision. It was a weighty decision to select a king. We'll see why in appointing a king. God's man on the scene takes chapter 12, the whole thing, to reveal the depth of their poor political decision. Which is fascinating that we just happen to be in 1 Samuel chapter 12 a few days before an election when an election sermon was planned. Isn't that interesting? An odd thing, yet again, at the beginning we see an example of God's representative engaging in the political front of that day. Wild. In fact... This, this, it, there's an argument that this was the first political action of the Israelites. Before there were judges, of course, but those judges were sent by God. Here they made a decision. It went from a theocracy to a, monar- to a monarchy. And what Samuel has to say in his, what will be his final address in this capacity for the people is more than just a contrast to the joy that we saw exhibited from the Israelites last week. What we're going to see, I just want to give you kind of a landscape so that our runway is clear of where we're going. What we're going to see is that first Samuel is going to establish his own credibility, all right? Right out of the gate, he's going to establish his own personal credibility. Then he's going to shift and he's going to establish the credibility of God's record for, on behalf of the people of Israel. And then he's going to offer a warning, an indictment, and an exhortation. So that's kind of where we're headed. We're going to look at Samuel's credibility, God's credibility, a warning, an indictment, and a really sweet exhortation, and we'll draw out a, just two applications. So really simple, really simple message, really simple passage here, to be honest with you. However, it is extraordinarily sobering. So look at chapter 12, verse 1. This is what it says. Now Samuel said to all Israel, indeed, I have heeded your voice. And that all you said to me, and I've made a king over you. And now, here is the king walking before you, and I am old and gray-headed. Look, my sons are with you. So Samuel begins this final address with making uh, this, in, in response to this decision for a king, clearly one that the people demanded. You wanted a king, here he is. He's now walking before you. Why I, there's a contrast drawn here. While I am old and gray-headed, you have this young king before you. The coronation of Saul ha- has occurred. And, um, and this is, in a sense, the coronation has occurred, but this is, in a sense, the official passing of the baton from Samuel as the leader before God who was governed by God and the mouthpiece for God to the people. And now it is shifting to Saul to now be the one that it specifically says he goes before you now, okay? Samuel adds that his sons are with them, not before them or over them. Chapter 8, if you remember, revealed their disobedience. They served for dishonest gain. They took bribes. They did not walk in the ways of Samuel or the Lord, which removed their opportunity to lead in the way that Samuel did. So they're just with them. Not only are they just with them, but not in a position of authority over them, they're with them in the sense that the people know them, just like Samuel does. He knows their brokenness. Simple observation here. Transition, while, is a very, while it's a very difficult thing, transition is difficult. It is essential. Now, there's a caveat here, because we know that this transition isn't necessarily a great one. That's going to become more apparent in chapter 12. In fact, as we consider transition, it's a lack of transition ultimately leads to a lack of leadership and thus vision. However, and this is the huge flashing sign. I don't know if you're in the middle of a job transition. I don't know if you're considering a relation. I don't, I don't know where you're at. But just consider this as it pertains to transition. Particularly when it includes impacting major, major pieces of our life. We had better make sure and be certain that God is at the helm of the transitions that we engage in. When he isn't, and it's us, we make messes. We're going to see that this transition was not God's first choice, and yet he relents, allowing the people to choose Saul and have a king and be like everybody else. He continues, I've walked before you from my childhood to this day. Here I am. Witness against me 
before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whom have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. And they said, you've not cheated, you've not oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. Verse 5, then he said to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they answered, he is witness. You could write this down if you're taking notes. The reliability of God's man is established. The reliability of God's man is established. Samuel states the fact that they have known him since he was a child. They knew him. They had watched the mass majority of his entire life up until this point. And while they know that he is not, while we know that he is not perfect, i.e., his sons, when it came to his leadership of the people, he did not do so out of compulsion or bribery. Instead, he did so and served at, at, from a place of conviction and faithfulness. That much is clear. This setting that's taking place in chapter 12 is not unlike a legal setting. They're essentially holding court, and Samuel is establishing some very needed truth, but he's doing it systematically. He opens himself up first for criticism before he shares what he's going to share in chapter 12. And he says, have I stolen from you? Whose donkey did I take? Whose horse did I steal? Whose ox have I taken? Who have I oppressed? He asked these questions because theft and oppression from a leader reveals their personal distance from God and from righteousness. Theft and oppression reveals that the leader is compromised and unjust, which causes their words to lack both authority and efficacy. An oppressive leader is a bad leader. The idea that you would take the counsel of a man that stole your donkey last week is pretty far-fetched. And we don't really respond that much because not a lot of you guys have donkeys here. But if Pastor Frank stole your car last week and then got up and told everybody they shouldn't steal, you would be like, I'm not really tracking here. Then he asks, from whom have I taken a bribe with which to blind my eyes? We need to lean in here for a second. Low-hanging fruit. This is low-hanging fruit, but still powerful. Think about this. What we just read reveals that bribery is blinding. Bribery is blinding. That's the point of the bribe, is it not? Bribes are never about the item that is being exchanged. Bribes are offered to accomplish something far more valuable than the item itself that is being exchanged. Bribes exist to purchase you, to accomplish the desires of someone else. If we go to the spiritual level, bribery is something that the enemy is engaged in on the daily. Is he not? Bribes require us to act as puppets, which inevitably forces us to communicate something that violates our conscience, or worse, something that is patently false. If we reverse engineer this truth, which I think is completely appropriate, what we see is that the one, if the one who has not received, or if the one who does receive a, a, a bribe is blinded, their vision is affected, then what we see when we reverse engineer this is that the one who has not received any bribes sees clearly. And sight in and of itself is a wildly divine thing. To be able to see when the waters are murky and things are confusing and chaos is everywhere Sight is something that is birthed exclusively by the Holy Spirit. Those that reject bribes are not puppets, but free thinkers that have the liberty to operate on conviction. They're authentic. They are free to dispense truth regardless of the repercussions because they are no slaves to man nor to the fiscal gain of the bribe that they have received, but they are free to be servants of God and used in his hands. It seems that, it just seems that the leaders that cannot be bought are pretty good leaders. Maybe you read between the lines on that. For us, though, if you desire, listen, for you, for if you desire to see clearly, if you desire to see clearly as a husband, as you lead your, your family, if you desire clearly as you lead your 
kids, as you lead your wife, as you lead in your workplace, as you lead your own per- if you desire to see clearly, refuse to be bought. Refuse to be bought. Refuse the offers of the enemy that allow you to compromise. Reject his offers and walk boldly before the Lord. Samuel says, it says after that, he says, if I have, I'll restore it. Did you see that statement? Samuel knew that he had not done any of these things. However, we are considering his entire life. So if we, sat, if we brought you guys up here and said, hey, since you were about 11, we've all seen everything. Have you done everything perfectly? We would be like, please don't, don't call my name. Please, don't bring me up there. He knows that he had probably not done anything, uh, any of these things. However, his humility to restore it, if he had, since we're considering a multi-decade span of time, is on full display, his humility is. He's aware of his humanity, and his entire life was being offered up for criticism as he has led. While, while those that don't receive bribes are great leaders, I would like to submit this to you. Those that don't take bribes and also demonstrate humility are the best leaders. In response, the people say, you have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. All of Israel never took my donkey. Nope. You're good. Then Samuel says, all right, he said to them, the Lord is witness against you and is anointed, referencing Saul as a witness to this day, and uh, that you have not found anything in my hand. And they all answered and said, we agree. He's a witness. Very methodical here. Samuel states that the Lord is witness against the people and his anointed, Saul, is witness against the people. So their testimony, their, their firsthand personal testimony of his life has been confirmed by their own testimony and it has also been witnessed by two witnesses and, it, and, it, and those are present to hold them to account of their testimony, you see. And what's beautiful about this is Samuel masterfully establishes the reliability of his credibility before he steps into What's coming? Because it's not going to be a soft sail in the afternoon. He's going to be correcting them. However, his correction in some way directly involves him. Meaning, as the leader of Israel under God's leadership and the mouthpiece of God, he's going to rebuke them for choosing a king, spoiler alert, which could easily be misunderstood as some type of mutinous action by Samuel speaking selfishly because essentially he's being replaced. So he's establishing his credibility. It's very important detail. If it's not established, even for us, for those that you listen to, for those that you consider the counsel of, for those that you follow, Be sure that their integrity and reliability is evident. Because if it's not, we will open ourselves up to becoming pawns on someone else's chessboard. And that isn't fun. Look at verse 6. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did before you and your fathers. You could write this down. Secondly, a reminder of the righteous acts of God. What's about to happen, we're going to work through this, but these two pieces are going to be established, and then Samuel is going to transition into his official address. After Samuel's reliability is established, he quickly turns the eyes of the Israelites to the Lord. It was the Lord that raised up Moses and Aaron, It was the Lord that brought them out of the land of Egypt. Indeed, Moses and Aaron led the people. But to be abundantly clear, he reminds them that it was the Lord that did the work on their behalf. And with their reminder of the authority and the power of God, Samuel instructs them to stand still that he may reason with them. Even in the context of his replacement. This is incredible. Samuel's desire is that the people would be reminded of the faithfulness and the goodness of God. Additionally, he is systematically building a legal case for the correction that's on its way. He continues in verse 8. These are the acts that he offers to the Israelites. When Jacob had gone into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of the land of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. 
Verse 9, and when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. Then they cried out to the Lord and said, we have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. But now deliver us from the hand of our enemies and we will serve you. And the Lord sent Jerubbabel, Bedan, Jephthah, and Samuel and delivered you from the hand of your enemies on every side. And you dwelt in safety. A couple of thoughts. Samuel offers this, this excellent historical refresher to the people. I get, the, I get the, uh, the impression that they haven't checked out the 12 stones that got stacked up some time ago. He offers this historical refresher, and we're not going to dive into each of these acts of God because Saul, uh, sorry, Samuel does not share them for us to dig into the details. What he's doing is he shares them to remind the people that not once has God failed. That's why he shares them. He doesn't share them so that they can have uh, meaningless debates about what happened in the events. He's simply establishing that there's a sequence that, it, that has always occurred and it reveals God's consistency. This is how it goes. There's a couple different combinations. One is this. The people are oppressed. They cry out to God. God delivers them. Here's another. The people reject God. They choose sin. He sells them into the hands of the pagans that they chose to live like. Then they cry out. They confess their sin. And he delivers them. God has fought against their enemies on their behalf. God has delivered from oppressors. And even when their problems were due to their own personal disobedience, when they cried out, he showed up. Not once. Not once in their history did God give up on them. And not once had he been unjust. Not one time. The purpose of this reminder is to establish God's eternal righteousness that is proven with evidence, not concepts, with evidence, and to remind them that crying out to him has always received a response. We can get so caught up in the moments of life where all of a sudden those moments turn into months and it's easy to forget the faithful acts of God just in our own lives. And then we begin to act irrationally just as the Israelites did recorded in the very next verse. But I want you to just stop for a second. I'm, I'm just going, we don't have the time, but I'm just, I want you to stop. I want us all to stop. So if you're, if you're under, just, just, just set, set things aside and clear the mind for 15 to 20 seconds for a second. Just, not a second, 20 of them, all right? I want us to just sit for 20 seconds. And I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to remind you of just a few of the ways that God has shown up on your behalf in the most unmistakable, unbelievable ways. Think through that for a second. He delivered you from sin, saved you from something insane, set you free from addiction, is setting you free from addiction. I'm going to just be quiet for 15 seconds. take a lot more time to get it all listed. Godly living requires consistently remembering God's gracious involvement in our life, church. Consistent remembering. It should be a common practice for us to pause at some point during the day when everything it is like, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my mind is typically the perfect spot to go all right let me take 15 seconds here and just let the holy spirit remind him i was i was dead i was spiritually dead i've been made alive okay all right i was alone god brought a spouse we were barren we have kids our relationship was broken he mended it so with samuel's credibility established in God's faithfulness right in the front of mind we get to the purpose of Samuel's address you could write this down the first of three parts from Samuel is a riveting warning verse 12 
And when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. And then everybody said, "Uh Uh-oh. Nahash shows up, if you remember, and in their fear, they forgot all of the prior times of trouble. They just disappeared because they bowed the knee to fear. In a moment, in a, in a multi-generational expression of God's faithfulness, showing up and delivering time and time and time again, the recipe has never changed, cry out to God. And they don't. Instead, they decide, we're going to have a king. They don't cry out. They don't ask for God to give counsel. They don't go to Samuel and go, what does God want us to do? They don't go, Lord, what's the battle plan? None of that. Instead of inquiring of the Lord or of Samuel, they respond and say, nope, let's have a king over us. And one of the questions that gets raised, of course, is it it was given insight by Samuel previously as to why they wanted a king. Why would you want a king? It's just somebody else you have to deal with. Why do you have, why, why, why have a king? Well, they wanted to be like everybody else. They wanted to have someone represent them. Pastor Billy uh, illuminated that last week, of course. They wanted to have a standing army so that they wouldn't have to go out and fight the battles themselves. And there is the beginning of the root of the issue, I believe. This is just me. But I do believe one of the reasons that they considered and so desired a king is because they were tired of the personal responsibilities that God had set their hands to. If we have a king, it's not necessarily our fault. We might have a terrible king. We'll just blame him. Well, it's not our fault. It's the government's. There's some heat coming on that in just a second. Just hang on with me. They missed the forest for the trees. They already had the king as their king, which reminds me, I did not tell you the title of this sermon, but it is the king or a king. That is the question. The Lord God was their king, Samuel makes clear, which means, which means you didn't just pick a king, you replaced the king. You abandoned the one with a flawless track record for one whose track record you did not know. And on this side of history, we know it doesn't go well. Look at verse 13. Now, therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen and whom you have so desired. And take note. This is why this is a warning. Because there's like warning language all up in these verses. Take note. Maybe when you're telling your kids something, hey, hey. Take note. Pay attention. If you don't catch this, you don't catch something else. Take note, the Lord has set a king over you. You think you picked him, and you did, and you desired him, but the Lord's still over him. So here he is. You chose him, you asked for him. In fact, that's the better translation of the Hebrew word that's used for desire here. It's actually to ask or demand. And then he says, take note, the Lord has set the king over you. This this is the moment that I think, if if you remember, I think this is the moment where the Israelites are like, whoo, did you see that? Nahash is going to take our eyeballs. We killed everybody. That's sick. We got a king. And Samuel starts, and they're like, okay, what's he saying? Yeah, God's been good. Yeah, we just laid, we just, we just did it. Yeah, God's been good. Samuel, he's legit. We're good. You picked a king when God was your king. I think this is the moment, like the little balloon is like, Wee! you know? I think this is the moment, do you remember as a kid asking your parents for something that you knew the answer was no, but they said yes to just to teach you a lesson? Remember that? And you're like, all right, they said yes. I know it should have been no. I kind of want to do this, but I think this is a test. You know those moments? I think that's kind of where they're at. They're like, ah. You chose him. You ask for him, you ask for the king, but do not be confused. Samuel makes it clear, God is the one who set him where he is. Clarifying that while they do have a king, the king still resides as the chosen king above all of them. 
we should be cautious what we ask or demand from God because we just might get it. You ever sit, Lord, if I just had a million dollars, I would bless so many people. <laughs> That's what we say first, right? Because we got to qualify it. I would tie that thing away. Lord, if I, just had, if I just had this, if my life just looked like this, if my relationship looked like that, you should be cautious what you ask or demand of God because he just might allow your choices to teach you. Then he offers this details of the warning. Look at it. It's conditional language in verse 14. If you fear the Lord and you serve him and obey his voice, and you do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, you need to pay close attention to these words. This is wild. Then both... You and your king, who reigns over you, will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but you rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Check this out with me for a second. If you fear. He didn't say if y'all fear. He said if you the Israelite people, if you fear and obey God, if you obey his voice and you do not rebel, the response will be that you and your king will continue following the Lord your God. Holy smokes, are you kidding me? We just unveiled an exegetical truth that communicates, it seems as though the obedience of the people of a nation underneath a ruler, they have direct impact on how the ruler operates. Do you see that? He did not say, he did not say, sorry. That happened about an hour and a half ago. I read that and I was like, oh. he did not say, if you and Saul will be obedient to God, then you will follow God. He said, if you, if you will follow and obey the voice of God, then you and your king will continue following him. It seems as though, it seems as though it, that we might not be a nation that is divided because we, we have two different political parties. It, it just might seem that we're divided because we don't follow God. We don't follow God. We're divided over righteousness. So could we stop it? Well, they, well, they, no, no. Well, the kingdom of darkness looks like this, and the kingdom of light looks like this, and the answer is for the people of God to start acting like the people of God. The vitality of the Israelites hinges not on their king, but on their obedience to the king. Samuel tells them that if they do not obey God, he will be against them. King or no king, obedience is required in church for us. Today, that is still the requirement. It's obedience. We overcomplicate Christianity so much. If we just take the word and go, hey, you want to build a healthy nation? Here's some ideas that just, just flat out work. They just work. Obedience is what produces the advocacy and the safety of God. Serve God and obey him, or he will stand against you. With this warning on the table and reality is setting in, Samuel follows with a sharp indictment, revealing the depth of their decision. Look at verse 16. Now therefore stand and see that this great thing that the Lord has done before your eyes, he's, well, that he's going to do before your eyes, future tense. Is today not the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord, and he will send thunder and rain, that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great. Which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking for a king for yourselves. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for us. Pay attention to their response. Pray for us your servants, to the Lord your God, that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins the evil of asking for a king for ourselves. You 
You know, one of the things that I just thought about just now, it's interesting, is when the Israelites are more concerned with preserving their lives than they are walking in obedience to God, things just really get messed up. And I wonder if that's also one of the areas that we've gone astray is that we're more fixated on self-preservation than we are honoring God. You could write this down, a regrettable indictment. A regret, we're going to see a regrettable indictment with divine confirmation. Samuel leaves nothing on the table. There's no ambiguity here. He doesn't leave the people wondering what it is that he means. He says, watch. Even though, this is fascinating, even though we've established that my words are reliable, my testimony is good, I've got witnesses, God's record's perfect, meaning there's no reason for you to question what I'm about to say, in addition to, so that there's no questions asked, God is going to divinely confirm my words in real time so that there will be no doubt at all. He says, I'm going to call on the Lord. He's going to send thunder and rain so that you'll perceive and recognize what you've done in choosing a king is wicked and evil. <laughs> so do you see the contrast? We've gone from, woo, Saul's our man, he's our guy, woo, to Samuel going, what you've done is wicked. And it is evil. What you've done in choosing a king is nothing short of evil. Why? Well, because you've rejected the kingship and the lordship of God himself by choosing one. Samuel did call on the Lord, and the Lord does answer with rain and thunder, and the response of the people was fear of Samuel and fear of the Lord. And the response of the people is fascinating. And I just got to, I can't move past this. They, they repent. If you notice, they repent. They say, pray for us that we may not die, still concerned about themselves. Nevertheless, they do repent. They recognize their sin. Because we've greatly added to our sins in asking for a king. The faithful man of God says what no one wants to hear. Samuel's proving that right now. The faithful man of God says what no one wants to hear, and I want you to consider the response of the people that received the message. Truth really does set people free. This revelation of their wickedness and their evil action does not lead them into further debauchery and to rebel. Instead, it led them to repentance. Making this statement that Samuel offers, it brings no gain to Samuel. None. In fact, this statement and this setting and this sermonette in this legal setting, uh, legal strategy that he's laid out before the people has a high probability of the people responding in hatred towards Samuel. But the rebuke brings great gain to the people if they receive it. Great leaders say what no one wants to hear because they're motivated by real love. Do you fear saying what must be said? That which is undeniably true because of the repercussions that may come? Because I want to ask you a question in light of 1 Samuel 12. Who will reign your heart? The king or a king? As a good spiritual leader in their response of fear, Samuel leaves them with a righteous exhortation, if you're keeping notes. Righteous exhortation. So we've got this indictment that came, and now we have a righteous exhortation as we move towards the close. Verse 20, then Samuel said to the people, do not fear. You've done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Fear of anything other than God will not accomplish the will of God. They failed, and they failed miserably. And yet fear was not going to be the solution that provided for them. Fear wasn't going to accomplish anything for them. Samuel says, do not fear, essentially, do not fear, follow God. That's what he says. When your, when your failures encroach and, 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 and shame and guilt begin to be piled on, the encouragement from 1 Samuel 12 is not to fall victim to paralyzing, 
to paralyzing fear, but instead to be faithful and follow God. Don't sit anywhere. Get up and follow the person of God who delivers men and women for all of generations. Follow him. Don't sit there. Following a king will not be sufficient for the Israelites. And it will not be sufficient for us, regardless of who or what we bow the knee to. But you follow the king, and fear cannot stay. Verse 21, do not turn aside, for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. Don't look for empty things, the things of the world, the kings, the rulers, the comfort that you find in them. They profit and deliver nothing. The idols that are available, he says, are nothing. Saul reminds them of something that he, they have experiential knowledge of. They know what it's like to uh, engage in pagan idolatry. They've been there. They've done that. And what has been their experience? It caused nothing but harm. And we know this intimately to be true as well. When you look back on the landscape of your life, and you see those peak moments where you bowed knees to idols or addictions or whatever those things were, You look back, and with sober eyes, you look back and you go, that provided me absolutely nothing of benefit. It only cost me. He's reminding the Israelites, do not go after the things that accomplished nothing on your behalf. When you you depart, isn't this interesting? He doesn't say that the idols cause them to depart from the Lord. He says when they depart from the Lord, it is then that they go find something to replace him. And we do the very same thing. You grow, you grow distant from your relationship with Jesus and your heart will find someone else to find, or something else or someone else to find satisfaction and approval. Something else to worship. Verse 22 says, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin in, uh, against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way, Samuel says. Oh, church, let's hear that encouragement. He said, God will not forsake his people. God will not forsake his people. I'll, I'll amen that all day long because I am a product of a God who has yet to forsake me when I have chosen to be disobedient to him. Praise God that we serve one who will not, he will not, he cannot forsake his own. Before him, we were nothing. Without him, we were not a people. With him, we are a people, and he's the one who made us his. In fact, in the same way that it says that it pleased God to make the Israelites his own people, the same, uh, very similar language is used in Isaiah 53 when it says that it pleased God to crush him so that we would have an atoning sacrifice for sin, and it was that atoning sacrifice that made us his people. He is pleased with his people, and he is, he is spent Far too much to forsake them. He will not. And Samuel's like, I'm not, I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to sin against God. Of course, I'm going to keep praying for you guys. I'm not just going to pray for you. I'm kind of, I'm kind of going to be a little bit of an annoyance. You'll see in coming chapters because I'm going to teach you the good and right way. Good shepherd. Verse 24 and 25 as we finish. Only fear the Lord. And serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. He concludes this encouragement again stating, only fear God, serve God with all your heart, remember the great things that he has done for you. If you do not, you and your king will be swept away. We could probably finish with that being our application, but I got two that I just cannot let go. So I've got two applications for you. The first one is this. Obey God and cry out to him when you don't. Obey God and cry out to him when you don't. The band's going to go ahead and come out I want you to think about this. Our assignment 
regardless of the ruler, is to serve God. That is the mega theme of 1 Samuel chapter 12. Serve God. And the consistent phrase that shows up is to cry out to him. He has never not responded to the son or the daughter that cries out to him. Obey God and cry out to him when you don't. And he makes this statement in light of being obedient to God. He says, serve him with your whole heart. Meaning, anything that touches the heart, which is everything, is required to be under subjection of the person of Christ. So Calvary Chapel, be obedient in your private, secret, personal life. Be obedient to him with your thoughts. Be obedient to him with your marriage. Be obedient to him as you parent. Be obedient to him in your finances. Be obedient in your jobs, your friendships, your interactions. Be obedient to God. There is no compartmentalization of obedience in a life of faith. Pastor Frank shared at the beginning of this sermon, as a nation, our context is is unique. In a few days, there's going to be a significant shift. No matter what happens, significant shift is happening. And ironically, you have a voice that impacts the trajectory of our nation. And isn't it fascinating? Our our voices impact the experiences in people's communities and people's lives. And so I would just exhort you to be obedient with your vote. God's desire is beyond evident in 1 Samuel chapter 12. He desires to have a people that can as freely as much as possible be governed by him. And I would just add that there's one policy or idea worth considering that gives a lot of clarity on the thing that sits in front of us. One one set of ideas looks to extend the hand of the king in our nation, the government, and one looks to restrain that hand so that people can operate in conviction and serve the God of their choice, even if it isn't Yahweh. not submitting that that's a good idea, just so we're clear. Steward what's been entrusted to you. Now, with that being said, with that being said, we, obedience is required in every lane of life. However, with that being said, you could write this down. There is only one king. There is only one king. Serve him. Because when we do, from the bottom to the top, nations are altered. There is one king. Humanity may appoint leaders, but only one leader wields all authority over them all. There's only one king that is holy. There's only one king that delivers every single time. There's only one king that is righteous. There's one king that's perfect. There's one king that has a flawless track record. There's one king that's all powerful. There's one king who loves perfectly. There is one king who speaks all truth and tells no lies. In fact, Deuteronomy 8, in my reading this week, he does not take any bribes, just like Samuel did not. One king forgives. One king sets people free. One king saves souls. One king, only one king, soaked a rugged tree with perfect blood for imperfect people and only one king rose again on the third day defeating sin and Satan. One king is enthroned above all kingdoms. One king is worthy. One king. And that is our king. He is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. So regardless of what happens this week, our king sits on the throne and it is our job to serve him only. Jesus, we come before you and we ask that we would be a people that honor you. Lord, as we step towards communion, How appropriate. Father, we thank you that we serve 
the king. Not a king. And Lord, if there's anyone in this room who has found that they are not serving the king of all kings, but they are serving a lesser king, it may be their own sin. It may be that they have idolized a man or a woman. Would it not be so? Would the church, would you make us holy? Would you make us righteous? Would you purify us? And would our hope, Lord, we are, of course, we will be obedient as we steward the influence that you have given us. And we know that you use men, broken men, to accomplish your purposes. The last 50 or 35 or however many minutes it's been is a testimony of that. And so while we look to engage those that we love and the nation that we love, our hope is not in anything other than you. I'm going to ask our guys that are passing out communion to come forward, our ladies. Listen, here's the deal. Communion is not for everybody. It's for the son or the daughter of Jesus. If you don't know or have relationship with him, the gospel kind of just got shown up there at the end. He, 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 let, he, he bled and he died. You guys go ahead. Y'all are good to just start passing it out. Listen, he bled and he died. His body was broken for you. His blood was shed for you to impute the righteousness of God Almighty upon you. And if you don't know him, then you need to let this pass. It's condemning for you. However, if you desire to know him, if you desire to have relationship with him, the gospel is profoundly supernatural and yet simple. Jesus told his disciples, you're going to have to become like these kids. Heaven's made up of people just like this. It's a mustard seed of faith that transforms a life. And so this is what the scripture says. If you confess with your mouth that Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, essentially, I agree that the gospel is true. The scripture says he will save you instantaneously. Done. So it may be that right now, just in the privacy of your seat, as this is coming towards you, you go, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. You're him. I love you. I want you to lead my life. Be the Lord of my life. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Set me free. And I'll follow you the rest of my life. He'll save you right now. Church, we're going to close in song, but you take the time that you need. That, that bread rec- is a remembrance of the broken body of Christ. It's by his wounds that we're healed. That cup represents the blood of Christ, which is shed for the sins of humanity. And how appropriate, before we as a nation decide who we really are, we go to the communion table and we ask him to show up.